global oil prices are chugging higher and rendering uncertain prospects of the economy here in the country and elsewhere. So what are the causes and consequences of higher global oil prices? And does this reality look to affect monetary policies? Is the economy past the risk of a recession? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Today, we take the pulse of the economy amid higher global oil prices. And for this particular purpose, I have Professor Song Suyang at Chungang University with us. Professor Song, it's good to speak with you again. Uh, thank you for having me. I also have Professor Greg Buchak at Stanford University. Professor Buchak, it's a pleasure as always. Glad to be here. Right, Professor Buchak, let's begin then with your outlook regarding the U.S. Federal Reserve's policy direction. Sure. So uh, tomorrow, U.S. time, the Federal Reserve is going to release their, their latest policy uh, uh, interest rate. The Fed is currently targeting a rate between five and a quarter and five and a half percent. And given what we're seeing now with the economy and how the data is looking and how the Fed has been communicating, I'd expect to stay there. So why do I think that? Um, it's important to sort of keep in mind what the Fed is trying to achieve. The Fed's mandate is two things stable inflation of about 2% annually over the long term and full employment. Now, the model that the Fed sort of has in mind when they're trying to achieve this goal is that there's a trade-off between inflation and employment. Higher interest rates can sort of slow down an overheating economy. They can reduce inflation. But slowing down the economy may mean higher unemployment. So sort of in predicting or thinking through what the Fed is going to do, you really have to focus on where we are on that inflation unemployment curve. If high inflation is the problem, that points towards higher rates. If high unemployment is the problem, that points towards lower rates. So right now, inflation, kind of depending on how you measure it, it's around 4%. That's well above the Fed's 2% target. The trend is good, but that level is still too high. Uh, on the other hand, unemployment is very low. It's about 3.8%. People who want a job can find a job. Most people would consider that to be full employment. So things are looking really good on that side of the equation. Given that inflation is above target and we're essentially at full employment, I don't think the Fed will be in any rush to start reducing rates until there's sort of much more dramatic shifts in, in sort of macroeconomic fundamentals. Of course, the Fed wants to be thinking, getting out in front of new developments and, and think about forward-looking indicators. I think we'll discuss this a little later. Some things look good, some things don't look good. Uh, I don't think there are any huge ringing alarm bells going off right now that will make the Fed dramatically change course. Right. And staying with a potential rate uh, cut by the Fed, Professor Buchak, some claim that a Fed's rate hike, a rate cut that is, will likely take place after the first quarter of 2024. Do you share this outlook? Well, I, I don't think it'll happen uh, at tomorrow's meeting. And I, and I actually think rates will be higher for longer than a lot of people expect. Inflation is high. The unemployment situation looks good. No reason to lower rates now. I don't think there's any obvious issues that will make the Fed deviate for some time. I think, you know, backing up, a lot of this discussion sort of views this 5.5% interest rate environment as if it's some once in a lifetime event. And it's true, interest rates are higher than they have been over the past 20 years or so. But if you look over a longer period, this is a very, very normal level. The real outlier here is actually sort of the last 10 or 20 years of, of record low rates. And if anything, the Fed's latest moves are sort of more of a normalization back to these historic levels. Um, I think a lot of Fed watchers, they, they tend to be kind of capital markets type people. So they're, they're following stock prices, they're following bond prices, they're following M&A activity. They're really focused on that. That's understandable. But I think that sort of leads them to overthink how much the Fed actually cares about these things when they make decisions. So sure, maybe the stock market is a useful indicator to help the Fed know what's going on in the, in the economy, but the Fed's ultimate objective is not to manage stock prices. Uh, uh, you know, this, this has sort of been borne out over this whole cycle of, of rate hiking. Business analysts at the beginning looked at capital market reactions and they were convinced the Fed wouldn't get very high, that they would start lowering rates quickly. And they turned out to be totally wrong about that. Even uh, during a little mini banking crisis we had a couple months ago, people thought the Fed was going to give up and they didn't. Uh, and, you know, I sort of said the same thing then. The Fed cares about inflation and unemployment. That's the objective. Everything else is secondary. And that objective says, given what's going on now, rates stay up. Right. And staying with monetary oh. policies, Professor Song, what is your uh -huh. outlook with regard to the Bank of Korea's future direction? 
Uh, for the Korea economy, actually, the outlook is very uh, quite uh, uh, difficult to make a forecast. The reason is a very opposing uh, directional movement occurs because, as you mentioned earlier, the oil price surged recently, of course, but it is a little bit stabilized. And this morning and yesterday, it is lower than $90, but still it's very high. And on the other hand, the stagnant growth rate of the economy, our South Korea's economy also, because of the some uh, relatively lower growth rate for China and India, which was forecasted and uh, estimated by the uh, Asian Development Bank. Um, they have lowered uh, expected growth rate further. So to that regard, I think uh, the, this stagnant economic growth rate and the surging inflation, then the Bank of Korea uh, faced a very difficult uh, situation quite uh, right now. But what matters right now, as uh, Professor Buchak mentioned, uh, the higher, longer interest rate remains a little bit longer. And the and the reason I think the inflation surge would be, even though it is temporary, then still two days ago, Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary of the United States, has mentioned that uh, the current inflation rate at the full employment, he, she emphasized that the need to slow the economic growth rate. Because uh, according to the data, American U.S. economy uh, turns out to be a very big success, even though they are concerned about the slowing the economic growth. But however, in Korea, and uh, we are very concerned about the stagnant economic growth rate, just 0.6% in the last uh, quarter and 0.9% uh, 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 quarter. And uh, so that is, uh, even though the price, uh, producer price index remains relatively stable, but very still high at the high level since 2021. So my concern is uh, therefore, there is much room for the uh, Bank of Korea to change the direction. So most likely to stay what it is right now. That's mm. my uh, estimation. Right, indeed. Professor mm -hmm. Bucha, Professor Song mentioned uh, high global oil prices earlier mm. on. Could you tell us a bit about the factors perhaps fueling this latest surge and how long do you expect it to last? Sure. So as Professor Song mentioned, oil prices are up about 40% since early summer. That's a big increase. Sure. Uh, and that's translated to about a 10% increase in gasoline prices here in the U.S., which is a big deal, especially since so many Americans, uh, and, and I'm sure this is true around the world, drive a lot, and a lot of commercial transportation uses gasoline too. So it's not just driving, it's sort of getting deliveries and logistics for, for industrial production. Uh, so what's going on there? Economists are sort of very simple people. We like to think about the world in terms of demand and supply. Uh, demand for oil is high because, you know, despite some sort of signs of slowing, world economies are for the most part doing pretty well, especially countries that are big oil consumers like the U.S. Um, on the other hand, there have been a few negative oil supply shocks in recent months. So one of the big ones is that Russia and Saudi Arabia have agreed to large oil production cuts, just taking a lot of oil uh, sort of out of the market. And that sort of short term stuff is occurring in the background of this sort of longer term, slow global transition to green energy, where less oil production capital is actually coming online. So you, you may have seen about a week ago, the Biden administration banned drilling on millions of acres in Alaska. And all of these things are contributing to a, to a tighter supply of oil. So demand is strong, supply shrinks, there's only one uh, uh, place for prices to go, and that's up. Some of these factors are temporary, or at least potentially could change quickly. Russia and Saudi Arabia could just change their policy tomorrow if that suited them. Other things like the green energy transition, these are longer secular trends that, that we'll, we'll be thinking about and dealing with for a long time. And you know, by the way, that, that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. If, if oil is more expensive because its price starts to reflect its actual environmental consequences, that's a reflection that oil has a higher real cost than we thought uh, and these higher prices will sort of encourage people to make their economic decisions a little bit differently. Right, hopefully, of course. Uh -huh. And Professor Sung, how do rising uh -huh. global oil prices in the meantime look to affect Korea's exports and, of course, its uh, domestic consumption? 
Yeah, uh, as Professor Buchak has mentioned, uh, some current uh, agreement between to reduction of oil pro oil uh, supply between Russia and Saudi Arabia has some effect. And uh, but, however, uh, when we look all the global perspective, particularly United States is only the country who has shown very outstanding performance in economics. So, in me economy, it means that they need the demand for oil is uh, rising for U U.S. economy. Of course, the U.S. have developed recently found some uh, oil reserve uh, fields and uh, several source resources. But, however, in what I'm mostly concerned is China has suffered from the, some kind of the way on the, some property crisis. Therefore, it means the growth rate is lower, which means the demand for oil, oil is, uh, is relatively lower than expected. And the same is the case for India. To that regard, uh, South Korea we have to think about do not uh, us economy is not anymore our some guide or criteria to determine our interest rate and oil price therefore i think for the outlook of the south korea the subsidy for the oil fuel price uh, should be should continue despite the, some increased uh, government deficit and uh, at, at the end of the year still what what matters right now is uh, oil price would be likely because of the reduced demand in the long, in the a little bit uh, midterm run in within or what two or three months at the end of the year. So the the, the price will be uh, low, lowered. That's uh, what I uh, make a forecast or what I forecast. All right. And in the meantime, then, Professor Song, do you suppose a mm -hmm. further extension of fuel tax cuts, given the mm -hmm. rising prices at the pumps, will perhaps serve to ease the cost of living for for consumers here in the country? Oh yeah, at least uh, because we have. Uh, as the Professor Vucha also mentioned, the driving cost, the uh, driving, uh, we will still rely much on the some uh, commu commu commution, uh, commuting of the uh, commuting in the, the cars and the consumption of oil is uh, necessary. Therefore, still, uh, because uh, however, in Korea is at the green chain transition to green uh, energy is relatively slow recently. So. That cast a little bit shadow shade over the uh, consumption, uh, uh, the, uh, the prospect of the, our uh, economy. But uh, clearly, I, uh, the oil price, uh, current current oil price surge is would be most likely the, some transient. Right. Mm. Professor Butcher, by the way, are mm. rising prices at the pumps perhaps reigniting fears about, a, about inflation yet again in the U.S.? So it's a it's a important question. It's actually sort of a complicated question. Um, of course, gasoline prices are super important uh, in the lives, the economic lives, the, the sort of economic health of consumers. And elevated prices at the pump can be super painful. Um, and if if prices remain uh, elevated for a long period of time, uh, hopefully they won't. Um, but it, it could absolutely be a drag on the Fed's fight against inflation, so both directly and indirectly, as workers sort of start needing higher wages in order to pay their bills. But uh, thinking from sort of like a policymaking perspective, when policymakers think about gas prices or energy prices, uh, they sort of think about these a little bit differently when fighting inflation. Uh, and as, as, as Professor Song mentioned, energy prices, they tend to be very volatile. A lot of these price moves can be very short term. Uh, uh, for these reasons we've discussed. And then if you're the, the policymaker and you're kind of focusing on these short-term fluctuations, you might get the wrong impression for where inflation is headed. And that might lead you to make sort of incorrect rate, uh, rate setting moves. So for, for these reasons, the Fed will actually often looks at a measure of inflation that excludes energy and food prices. This uh -huh. is so-called poor inflation. Um, food is a little bit like gasoline, like we need it, it's really important, but its price is very volatile and, and, and often fluctuates for reasons the Fed can't really influence, like the weather. So to, to be concrete about the numbers, uh, U.S. inflation without energy or food is at 4.3%, and it's been declining steadily. Uh, headline inflation, so that's inflation that sort of includes everything, including food and energy, that's been on a downward trend, but actually the, its latest print of 3.8%, that's actually a small increase over the previous month. And that, that difference is largely driven by the increases in energy prices that we've discussed. So 
Oil prices, super important for consumers. Uh, how the Fed thinks about them for policy decisions is a little bit more subtle. Right, I see. Oh. And beyond energy expenses, back here in Korea, Professor Sung, another concern uh -huh. for the country is the household debt here. Could you tell us a bit more about uh -huh. this? Yeah, uh, actually, household debt remains uh, increased uh, some uh, two, two years ago. But however, uh, when I checked the data, and uh, household debt remains relatively constant and stabilized. And uh, also the delinquency ratio of the household debt has uh, remains uh, at 0.3 percent. In May, it was it increased a little bit, 0.4 percent. But previously, it remains at 0.2 percent. So, to that regard, relatively household loan is not the increasing. It is not increasing as much as it used to be. So, for the past two years, relatively uh, household debt is. Uh, uh, relatively uh, stable, sta stabilized and does not change much. And uh, also the risk is uh, relatively sta uh, stayed wh where it used to be. Therefore, what I'm most concerned is rather than household debt, what I'm concerned is uh, currently government fiscal deficit because of the reduction of the tax revenue. Uh, in most of uh, uh, Commonly, the, uh, the fiscal deficit, when the government expenditure is increased more than the tax revenue, that could help increase the economic growth rate. But as we see, the current uh, South Korean economy has suffered from the stagnant growth rate, definitely. So even uh, Asia Development Bank has uh, adjusted Korean uh, economic growth rate uh, this year is uh, very uh, low. Currently, uh, it will be forecast at 1.5 percent, but uh, in the last two quarter, we have uh, recorded just a 0.9 percent. So without any impressive surge of the economic growth rate for the uh, following two quarters, uh, we may end up with very close to one percentage of growth rate. Of course, in 2020, for a little bit better, but still it is very slow. So to that regard, what, what is what I'm most concerned is stagnant growth rate. And another one is uh, some uh, fiscal deficit problem because the feature is very bad. Because of reduced rev tax revenue and reduced government expenditure, that means a stagnant uh, growth rate. And the, the third one is the increased Korean discount. Korean discount, which means that recently we have seen that the uh, close uh, the relationship between the North Korea and uh, Russia. That is really bad for the Korean economy. It has to increase the Korean discount, definitely. On the other hand, the current government's diplomatic position is uh, really help increase the Korean discount. Because uh, today I have seen the news that Iranian government, they are going to sue Korean government for the uh, payment of the interest, which was uh, incurred because of the holding uh, payment at the request of the US uh, government. And uh, however, in the early January, you may remember that uh, President Yoon has paid a visit to United Arab Emirates and he designated Iran is the enemy to United Arab Emirates. So that kind, that kind of remarks does not help ease the burden of Korea discount. So those are really, uh, really risky factor for the South Korean economy right now. Right, I see. And beyond national boundaries, Professor Buchak, here's yet another complicated mm. question. Is the U.S. past the threat of a recession? Some say yes, some say no. What do you say? Uh, I say I'm not sure. I think a, a recession is always possible. Uh, I don't think anyone would be uh, totally shocked if the U.S. had a quarter or two of very low or mildly negative growth. Um, whether it's technically a recession or not, I, I don't think it will be catastrophic. I think the two biggest threats to growth over the past year were uh, a banking issue that started in Silicon Valley Bank around March uh, and the ongoing war in Ukraine. And you know neither of these really materialized into a full-fledged economic crisis, uh, at least for third parties. There was some expectation that there would be a big energy crisis in Europe, and, and, and that didn't happen. Um, to me, uh, this is a very uh, U.S. specific risk factor, but the, the biggest unknown is whether the U.S. commercial real estate sector will implode uh, and bring other sectors with it. So 
things like work from home and rising interest rates have, have really tested this particular sector, and it's a big part of the economy. Uh, and to give you an example, um, office vacancy rates in downtown San Francisco, so near where oh. I live, uh, are above 30%, which is a, a huge number oh. of people, a huge amount of office space that's just not being used. And on top of that, uh, a lot of low interest rate debt happens to be coming due in the next few years, and borrowers there are going to have to refinance at much, much higher rates. So there's there's going to be a lot of pain in this sector. Um, it sort of remains to be seen whether there's any contagion. Uh, these issues are certainly known about, and they're on the mind of, of a lot of banks and a lot of important financial institutions that have exposure here. Uh, so hopefully they won't catch anybody by surprise. Um, that's a little pessimistic. There are, there are a lot of good signs, too. So as I mentioned before, the U.S. unemployment rate is, is very low. There's demand for workers. Uh, as the workers get paid, they turn around and they buy things and they, they keep the economy going. There's economic growth. There's innovation happening all the time. Uh, despite a challenging interest rate environment for a lot of financial institutions, the, the banking system actually does seem pretty resilient now. Now, that can change very quickly, as we saw uh, earlier this year. But for now, things look OK there. Um, retail sales number came in last week, and there, there was modest growth there. So I, I sort of think taken together, the current data points a, a pretty optimistic picture. But there are a few items uh, coming down the pipeline for the US that, that might be a bit challenging. Right, indeed, I see. And uh -huh. then, Professor Song, very briefly speaking, because uh -huh. I believe we have about a minute or so, what do you suggest, perhaps, to better weather the risk factors out there for the economy? Uh, yeah. Actually, Korea has, uh, uh, not, uh, not notorious, but excess saving, uh, really, bigger than investment is uh, another problem. And uh, uh, particularly to that regard, so I hope the, our economy should be reinvigorated through the increased of the consumption and uh, maybe lowering the interest rate and also the government bravely spend more to regrow the economy. That's right. uh, what I so suggest. Right, indeed, to bolster the economy then. Mm. All right, Professor Sung, as always, thank you so much for your insights. And Professor Buchak over in the US, thank you very much for your thoughts and your time. Thank it's you, pleasure. my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Right, well, that brings us to the end of Wednesday's edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching.